Hey guys, it's John and Darren here from Martinis and Murder. We are just having too much fun. There's a lot, Con. a lot of great people have stopped by the booth today. It's amazing. Follow along at hashtag Oxygen Crime Con. I am ecstatic. She's to been talk. so excited about this the whole day, guys. I haven't been able to shut up. We are here talking to Jan Broberg, who's from Abducted in Plain Sight, most infamously yeah. uh, recently. So many questions. John, why don't you kick it off? Well, welcome, Jan, by the way. Have, have you had a great day so far here at the Crime Con? I've had an incredible day yeah. today. I is this your that. first Crime yeah. Con? Yes. Nice. Absolutely. I was like, this is amazing. There's a gazillion people here. What were you expecting? There are when a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's I, tons I just, of people. I, honestly, I really Really didn't, I had heard of Comic-Con, yeah. and I knew that was a big event, but I'm like, oh, I don't know. How this many isn't... people are really interested? And all of a sudden, I'm like blown away. Yeah, it's been a great day. And they're the nicest people. They are. So, and they're concerned Absolutely. about these stories and about all of this. And I feel like that, for me, has been why I've been so loved and well-received today. Absolutely. Is people were here because... They have these big hearts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're interested too. But definitely, you know, it was yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What of what all have you been doing today so far since you've gotten here? So I got to do a presentation with the producers of the documentary, and it was really incredible. People, yeah. people told me they really learned something from that presentation. Oh yeah, they understood so much more about the documentary, like the characters, like my parents and, and, and how grooming affects the entire family and that we were all victims, not right. just me. So there were, was a lot of good that came out of that. And then we did a Q and A and a meet and greet and that was really So busy, fun. but in a good way, right? So good. Yeah. Since we, we were just sitting here and a couple of people had come up to shake your hand and just say, thank you for sharing your story. How has that been here? You know, that's been amazing yeah. to actually know that, that so many people share in your story or so, in, in some way maybe yeah. it's not exactly the same but it's about 30 percent of our kids and mm. so that means about 30 percent of the people walking around have been through some sort of sexual abuse as a child wow. so to have it to hug it out with yeah, people hug right, it out, right you know it's it's I've been pretty emotional about it. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it, and, it gives um, you a sense of love and community and to know that you're not the only one. You know, right. as, as unfortunate as that is, it's also very comforting and nice. Right, because and empowering, that's the movement. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. the power. If you can get your own story out there and it empowers somebody else to tell theirs, then all of a sudden we really are making an impact and a difference because people have not wanted to talk about this. It's too close to home. Right. Yeah. It's not a scary stranger. It's, a, it's somebody usually someone you know. You know. Yeah, it's usually our love someone. and love trust and trust. Well, I wanted to shift the conversation <clears throat> to Abducted in Plain Sight because it's probably one of my favorite documentaries I've ever seen, which is might be odd for you considering yeah, you're sort of the star of it. <laughs> but I understand. <laughs> what did you think of the reception of it? Did you think it was going to blow up as much as it had? It felt like one day was up and the next day everyone really was, was talking about it. Yeah, that was really weird. <laughs> and it's still a little surreal. Yeah. You know, that you, wherever I go, you know, I've been yeah. to a bunch of different places and somebody in a restaurant is talking about it behind me and I'm like, should I turn around and tell him, hey, that's my story. Hey, that's me. <laughs> that's me. Yeah. You, it's know, me. you should, really, by the way, Yeah, <laughs> and I usually do. But it is really strange to have it. I did not know that this would happen. I hoped that there would be millions of people who right. would be able to see the story and that it would help affect change and help them with their own healing, but you just don't know. And so, yeah, it's been amazing. Was Incredible. There, was there any hesitancy on your part to be part of the documentary at first to tell your story or you were about sharing your message to everyone? You know, I, I have been really like, how's the right way to say this? I have been wanting to share my story since I was about 30, when I felt like I was kind of whole and healed and complete, and then other things would come up in life. I knew that members of my family were not quite ready. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was all about waiting until everybody in our family was like, we can handle this. Right. And then we knew we, we would share completely, honestly, and, it was honest. Oh, it was It was <laughs> honest. It was honest. That's for sure. Um, how do you think that your life has changed since the documentary came out? Well, for one thing, actually having a platform like this to be able to get that message out. You know, I feel like the Me Too movement started something, and this to me feels like the continuation of Definitely. how are we empowering our children and then our grown-up children who are now adults that are still carrying around some sort of trauma in their life, and is there generational trauma that's being passed on, or are we actually ending the cycle of abuse? Are we actually doing the hard work of bringing out the predator from the corner of our yeah. family or our congregation or our community? 
community or our school and actually making them stand in the light of justice and have to go to jail so they don't have access to any more kids. It doesn't happen nearly as much as you would think. As much They're as still should. running around at the family reunion and we know they're a predator on some level, but we don't do it because it's too hard. Wow. So wow. that's how it's changed. Like the platform to talk about it and getting other people to talk about it has just skyrocketed, which is amazing. Your message has been so important and certainly in your panel you said such. Can you explain how predators groom their targets? You know, you first, they target somebody that they think Maybe it's the perfect target, but for me, my guy had victims before and mm. after. Robert so, Birchtold did. Yes, wow. yes, Robert Birchtold. And so I know that now. Right. So really, they, they figure out where is the most maybe trusting, the most loving, the most kind. Maybe they look at those things, and then they build trust within that whether they're in your family or they're a neighbor or a friend, they build the trust, then they start to separate people. That's the next thing. They, they separate and they have their own special relationship with this person and their own special relationship with that one. And pretty soon when you're isolated, yeah. then there's opportunities that don't come until that isolation happens. And that's kind of the stages, some of the stages of grooming. And then next it's the exploitation of that trust and isolation, which is, Generally speaking, it has to do with some sort of sexual crime. Right. Yeah. When Abducted in Plain Sight came out on Netflix, was it hard for you to watch it back? Knowing, you know, kind of sitting there in your maybe living room and kind of watching it play out? You know, it, it was hard. It was harder on me when we were, when we were first Starting invited the to the screenings yeah. and stuff. And I was like... Oh, but that's not who my dad is, you know? My dad's the most amazing person. Are people going to be left with that's the sum total of my dad? Yeah. It was hard in that way. But even both of my parents, they were the ones who said, we have to tell everything. It has to be done honestly so that people will make the connection to how it could happen to them. And so just their strength made it okay because you know i still want to protect my parents because i know who they really are right course, totally you know? yeah <laughs> i was gonna say because your parents were so heavily involved i'm sure there were people could make judgments yeah. on who you know like how could they not see this how could they not do that i mean right but to your point grooming i mean it doesn't necessarily matter that you're a kid it could happen to an adult too it's a matter of being aware but your parents were originally ecstatic or hesitant about telling their story because it's a little it's yeah. vulnerable. It's a little yeah. um, eye-opening, yeah. to say the least. Yes. And my mom and I had been speaking at small little book clubs or conferences that we were invited to to tell the story for a number of years, but not the rest of my family members. So it was kind of, uh, uh, you know, this new, this new um, frontier, this new yeah. landscape, like... I think we should tell the story, but I don't really know how that's gonna affect my life and how hard it might be or how embarrassing or if people will still be my friends. Yeah. Yeah. They'll think, well, why didn't you know or why didn't you see? And, and yet all of us knew that we were groomed and all of us knew that the documentary would show that right. and that that was the missing conversation. So we were willing to move forward and, and we, we, we all survived it, okay? You yes, did. You did. Was, so there any, far. was there any part of you going through that process, maybe when you were younger, before you healed, when you were around 30, you said, yeah. that blamed your parents? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, blame's a really strong word. It is. There, was, there were times in my 20s where what I felt was I was angry that I lost five years of my childhood and I never had a normal, you know, I didn't have those normal years. And yeah. so I was angry about that. So, yes. Did I, did, I, did I call up my mom and dad and cry and scream at them sometimes? I did, you know. How I did you not? I, right, but the great part of it was they completely acknowledged how I felt. Yeah. They completely just continually apologized. They didn't try to defend themselves. They didn't try to say, oh, well, we didn't see. They just were like, we are so sorry. We know how awful, we feel awful. We feel with you the same kinds of feelings. Yeah, I'm sure and they probably do. They did, yeah, yeah and they do. And, and that was huge. Again, it was another step in my healing process because my own parents yeah. were so incredible yeah. to listen. Yeah. I mean, they just listened. And I, other people, I tell that all the time, 
do not try to defend yourself or to say, well, you know, this is what we saw or didn't see. Just be with the person right. yeah. in their emotional journey. And let them have those emotions, and right? And let right. them go through it, yeah. One of the questions that I'm interested in asking survivors is, how they healed and how were you able to get to a place because unfortunately not everyone can get over it and heal in the right way and right. you've been such a great advocate being able to speak so open and honestly about it i think we should commend you for that oh, and but so how how did you heal how did you find the way to get through you know, it you know it's 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 there's not a one simple answer but there yeah. are some simple questions that throughout my life i asked myself First of all, who do I want to be in the room? Who do I want to be in the world? Right. And am I willing to let go? Amazing. And so because of those questions that I continually asked myself, I found times when I was like, do I want to be the person in the room that has the saddest, hardest story? Yeah. Or do I want to be the person in the room that is the most loving, the most grateful, the most, you know, that people want to be around because they're the happiest person in the room. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting how when you start to really self-reflect and ask yourself questions, yeah. you can go, I'm not the happiest person in the room. How come and how can I get there? And then you figure out Amazing. how to step over that line. Because I tell everybody, 10% of your life, it, there's going to be something ugly, dark, hard, 100%. difficult. Every person, every human being has it. So when you decide, I don't want to live with that all the time, I don't want it to be running my life all the time, and you decide I want to step over into that 90%, which is the rest of my life, right. how am I going to do it? How am I going to stand in the 90%? And that requires some emotional healing, some mental health care. You're, you have to clean up these things that have happened and stand for yourself like you would to brush your teeth. Right. Yeah. And I tell people, get your emotional health, your emotional support system in place. That might be a therapist, a good book, you know, some, yeah. some sort of self-help programs that you watch, go to a workshop, you know, find some people to serve and talk to and find out you're not the only one so that you can, you know, yeah. find a way to help Community. and share. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways you can do it, but you have to ask yourself the question. Yes. Do I want to actually live there or am I comfortable living in kind of the trauma of my life? And some people don't ever they get out of there. it. You're yeah. right. They don't either find the help or they don't ever ask themselves the questions. Could I? Yeah. Could I come out of that? And I believe you can. I mean, you're a link, the living testament to, to doing that. Right. I'm just so curious of like how you, like, could you trust people again, especially men? That's you know, a great like, question. What was your dating life after <laughs> like that? Like, you know what well, I mean? Let's like, see I now. don't know. We'll we'll how much do you really want to know? Yeah, right. No, yeah. no We're honestly, live. be careful here. Yeah, yeah. I have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but again, that's being honest again. I've been married more than once and divorced more than once. Right. So again, it's like, it's like. Um, if you're honest, you realize that every stage you go through and every experience in your life, you're learning something from it, you're growing, you're stepping into the 90%, you're trying again, you're taking a risk. You have to consciously decide to do that. Yeah. And yet, I am such good friends with my ex-husbands and with my Love stepchildren, that. That, yeah. and they're such an important part of my life and my journey, and I have a beautiful son that I have an amazing relationship with, so would I really change any of those experiences? Right. No. Yeah. And yes, I have learned to trust again. I don't want the whole world to think that I told this story so that they never trust anybody, they don't have any good, right. wonderful, juicy relationships in their life. I told the story so that your antenna would be up, <laughs> so that you wouldn't just brush aside that little voice that says something's wrong, something's off. I want people to trust that yeah, more totally. and listen to it. But I want you to have amazing relationships. I'm still hoping there's another one out there for me. Well, I've been oh, single for a really Look, she's Long winking time. at the camera, so, yes. I'm not single, but I'll take you out, Jen. I will take you out just to Would hear you? your stories. Of course. I'd so take sweet. you out, too. Oh, oh <laughs> A love connection has been made, everybody. <laughs> I'm just curious, in your, because you have such a positive... Like, she just really a, does, yeah. Vibrancy about you. Have you forgiven Birch Told? That's a good question. You know, that's a really, I, I say this all the time forgiveness is a very tricky word. So I call it letting, have I been able to let it go? Yeah. And forgiveness, I've called it forgiveness too. Because I believe that as long as you are still in the side of life that is, I'm a victim, this happened to me, and now my life is ruined, you're in prison. 
Yeah. That is what I don't want. And so how do I go from the prison around myself? Right. Part of it was to let it go. And that's to freed you, right? Forgive, yeah. forgive him. But that does not mean that I don't want to put him and any other person that would harm a child in jail. Of course. Right, of course. That's not the same thing. People get that confused. So I think it's really important to know what I mean when I say, yes, I have been able yeah. to forgive him. Now, things come up at different stages in my life. And I'll think, oh, there it is again. I hate his absolute ever-living dead guts. Yeah. yeah. And I then mean, I'll be like, okay, now what is that stemming from? It's because I just had an experience when I gave birth and I was just like, I remember going through a stage after my son was born and like, how could anybody do this to a child? Because now I had a child yeah. and I was so angry. Yeah. You know, like you pretended like you loved me yeah. and my family and then to strap that person that you've loved to the back of a motorhome bed and assault them yeah. and brainwash them and do all those things. It was just like, I couldn't get over it for a while, but again, it's the okay. Let's find the right. The, let's find the pathway and the doorway because I don't want to stay in this prison. Right. I want to have freedom, and for me, freedom is is partly finding forgiveness. Yes, yeah, someone it really once, is. Someone once described hatred as drinking a bottle of poison and hoping the other person dies. Yeah. Is that how wow. you would That's describe a it? Really, it's perfect. I'm just hearing that sort of like That's message back. That's a perfect way to say it. It's going to ruin you if you. I mean, you. Yeah. I mean, and no one would blame you. Right. If of you thought not. about it every single day, no, yeah. everyone would expect that. And I do that. think about it every single day. Right. I just don't. Yeah. I just doesn't have that control over my emotional body or health anymore. Yeah, I was just gonna say, well, let's go back to the mental health thing, because there's such a stigma about right. seeking mental health, yeah. but it's so important for victims who wanna become survivors. And do you yes. think that, you know, therapy or some kind of, um, you know, mental health care. Care, yeah, exactly. Helped you along your way a lot? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It really did. And I and that's why I'm always the first person in the room to say take care of your own emotional cleanup or care or health or whatever that, you want yeah. to call it. But for me, it's like, would you go without brushing your teeth for six months? Yeah. Why would you go through the next six months of your life without some kind of help yeah. to clean up that part? It's right. every totally. bit as important, you know? And so I really do, I am very grateful. But for me, some of the time, it was just a really good self-help book. Yeah. Right. Or it was a really good conversation with my mom and dad. Or it was a really good episode on Oprah or Dr. <laughs> Oz or Dr. Phil or whatever your yeah, thing yeah. is. I mean, you just find ways to do it. And you and you just keep stepping into that 90%. Keep stepping over there and finding your way to it. And, and you know, again, like I've said, you don't do it by yourself. Yeah. You know, you, you really can't. It takes and a village. It really does. Yeah. Before we let you go, I just, you know, is there anyone out there who might be going through a similar thing? Is there a group that you recommend for them to go to or, or some type of victim advocacy group that they you should know, look up? There's a lot of different in every city now, I've been to about 20 of them in yeah. different, for different things. Yeah. You find out that there are so many groups that are doing such good work that I hate to name just one. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. love the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children because they not only are they looking for you know, missing children, but they also give great education. They have a wonderful website where you can get, you know, ideas or help and they also the resources. are resources yeah. to what you might be able to find in your community um there's a several others though if you okay. ha specifically put in what your issue is you know in like a google search you or can something. find you really can yeah it's amazing how many wonderful organizations i just got back from boulder and there's a, a new education program that they're putting implementing into their schools for third graders wow. and i believe it was called blue sky bridge and that program is on a third grade level allowing kids to see and understand if something is wrong that's amazing in how they're being treated that's fantastic and kids are coming and drawing pictures and telling and it's it's pretty amazing it's incredible it wow. really is we so need to make that a national thing exactly not just that's Colorado. what i said to them yeah. i said it's amazing you know because there's that that fine line between you don't want somebody wrongfully you know Worse. wrongfully um uh, targeted or accused, or, accused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i couldn't think of the word that's right. you know you don't want that to happen you want to do as much you as you can. You know can. the warning signs as well. Yeah. yeah, and the kids are not 
really, they don't know yet. Yeah, they, yeah, they don't they, know the signs. They don't even know. They don't even know if this no. is okay or not right. okay. They, they don't might, know what they don't know. Yeah, they might know it hurts, or they might know that, oh, I get rewarded, mm -hmm. you know. And they don't know what's wrong it's, and bad. Right, they don't know. So it, it's interesting. So I, I encourage people to really get local, because yeah. the more local you can find support, the better, because then you really do see it's in it's here in yeah, my community. Totally. Yeah. You know, I'm not alone right here in exactly. my little town or, or my area. So Amazing. that's kind of my... You can even you know. find it at CrimeCon. Yeah, I mean, it seems like hey. yeah. <laughs> Jim, thank you so much what and your story. family oh. for sharing everything and being so open and so vulnerable. And oh. we really appreciate Amazing. it. You've done thank great you. work. Wonderful. And thank and best you. Best of luck to you yeah, with everything. Best of luck. We're really excited it. to talk to you. So thank okay. you. Thanks, Jim. All Everyone right, else thanks. watching out there, CrimeCon 2019 coverage continues tomorrow. Keep following us along at hashtag Oxygen. Crime Con. And even more coverage on Oxygen.com. Johnny Boy, let's go get a drink. Let's do it. See you guys next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye.